If you're listening to this podcast, it's probably because a child you love and care for is differently wired. Are they also struggling in their current educational setting, seen only for what they're doing wrong while longing for positive relationships with peers and others? Envision a world where your child's unique abilities are not just recognized, but celebrated. A world where they can connect with others and their true potential is seen and appreciated. The Strength-Based Assessment Lab's mission is to build a world for your child just like that. Through its innovative approach, it aims to empower students, families, educators, and professionals to create positive, effective, and collaborative learning experiences. Be a part of shaping a brighter future for your child. Visit www.bgs.edu to learn more about what a strength-based assessment could mean for your family. That's bgs.edu. So many times kids associate reading with something that provokes anxiety. So we've got to do everything we can to counter that and make reading associated with the positive, um, with love, with comfort, with joy. Welcome to the Tilt Parenting Podcast, a podcast featuring interviews and conversations aimed at inspiring, informing, and supporting parents raising differently wired kids. I'm your host, Debbie Reber, and today's guest is Dr. Colleen Carroll, a writer, speaker, educator, and coach of parents of struggling readers. Today, Colleen and I are talking all about reading, specifically why it's important that parents and caregivers foster a love of reading in our children and how exactly we can do that, especially if our kids are what we would identify as being reluctant readers. If you have a child who isn't naturally gravitating towards books, this episode will give you some super practical and simple strategies for creating an environment that supports a child in developing a true love of reading. Before I get started with the show, I wanted to give a shout out to Tracy Page Johnson and Sherry Bennett, two generous supporters of the Tilt Parenting podcast on our Patreon campaign. Thank you so much for your support of what we're doing. If you would like to join Tracy and Sherry through Patreon, you can make a small contribution that will go towards funding the production costs associated with this little podcast. Please check out our Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash tilt parenting. You can support us for as little as $2 a month and every little bit makes a difference. Thank you so much for considering and for being a part of our community. And now let's get on with the show. Hey everyone, Debbie Reber here with the Tilt Parenting Podcast, and today's guest is a reading specialist who is on a mission to help kids everywhere foster a true love of reading, Dr. Colleen Carroll. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here today. Well, I'm excited to be bringing this topic to the podcast. As I said in in my introduction, you're a reading specialist, and on your website, you write... Over the past 15 years, I've worked with hundreds of parents to take kids from being frustrated, sad, and close to giving up on reading to being excited to read. Now I want to help you. I just love the way that you put that. And as an avid reader myself and the mama of, and probably even more avid reader in my son, Asher, I really appreciate that mission. So before we get into exactly how you do that and what parents can do in their own worlds to foster that love of reading in their own kids, could you take a few minutes to tell us a little bit about who you are and how you came to be doing this work? Absolutely. It's definitely been a journey. I, um, I began as a classroom teacher. I taught sixth grade, which is an elementary grade uh, and uh, sort of following a middle school model. So I had you know kids sort of in that transitional year of you know growing out of elementary school and going into middle school. And I was also a reading teacher for that same grade level. And in that time, for about a decade or so, I really learned how to teach kids how to read, all kinds of kids, students with disabilities, students with English language learning uh, challenges, and students who are below average, average, and above average readers. And so I really cut my teeth in the world of literacy, working with every kind of child and understanding what makes them tick as a reader. I grew then into a principal's position um, and then became a director of literacy and also assistant superintendent of schools over the course of my career and realized that that knowledge that I had gained, um, not all teachers had. It really was something that was almost unique to me 
in the way I pursued learning because it was such a passion for me. And I recognized that I really need to get out and help teachers learn this. Then through that work, I realized that we're missing a huge component of the help and the resources in the world of teaching kids to read, that being the parent. So I could do all this work with teachers, but then we have this untapped resource of wonderful parents who want their kids to be readers and who want to help their kids to be readers, but really don't know how. And in fact, teachers don't know how to tell them how. So that's how I developed this concept of really becoming a coach and an entrepreneur and a consultant to parents to bridge that gap between the home and the school environment and to really allow parents to pick up where teachers leave off, and not as reading teachers, but as passionate families of, of reading so that we can help kids when kids are not in school to develop a love of reading, not just the how to read. I'm curious where your own personal love of reading came from. Were you a book lover from a young age? And is that I really was. I absolutely uh, was wonderful at drowning myself in, you know, the, the books of my era, which really were um, the classics, we can, what we consider classics now. I really loved um, Bed Knobs and Broomsticks and Pippi Longstocking and the uh, Roald Dahl series and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and still wonderful, wonderful books today. So I was a lover of reading. And I think, you know, that gave me a perspective to be able to say for children who don't love to read what they are missing. My heart goes out to them. And, and it's so, I found it such a, um, an amazing experience in my life to be lost in the world of books that f- for children today who don't have that same experience, I want to help give that to them. Mm. I feel like that molds lives and I want to be able to do that. And of course, we know on top of the experiences that you have with just reading books, the knowledge and the vocabulary and the the mental capacity that it helps you grow as an individual and as a unique learner, you know, there's nothing more important than that because reading is the is the crux of all eventual learning. So it's it's a twofold, right? It's it's the experiences and the joy, but it's also the importance to your to the rest of your life's work. Mm hmm. You know, before we get more deeply into this conversation, I did just want to reiterate that this episode is not necessarily about students with learning differences who struggle with reading as a result of those differences. I, that's a whole other episode and one that, that you and I, Colleen, have talked about doing in the future, which I think is great. But today, just for listeners, we're really going to be looking at reading in general and why we want to foster that love of reading in our kids in the first place or why they might not love it already and what we can do if that is what's happening with our own kids. Now, you did touch upon some things and I want to see if we've missed anything in terms of why reading is so important. You talked about the knowledge, the vocabulary, the experience, you know, why is it something that is so important that all kids that we want all kids to have this love of reading. Is there anything else that, that we miss there? Sure. Well, one, there's, there's a lot of things I could go. I mean, I could write a dissertation on this on one topic alone. But the, probably one of the more important things that matters to everybody is what we call in the education world schema. And to make that easier, it's really building background knowledge. So everything that we learn in life our understanding of what that learning is, is always built on our prior understandings. It's always built on what we knew already about the world around us, and then we put new knowledge with it. When children read, they're building that background knowledge because we can't experience the whole world on our own. So when we read books about the jungle or this outer space or dinosaurs or snakes um, or fantasy stories, what we're really doing is we're helping to to build a a background knowledge that we're not going to get in another way. And when we do that, it adds to our learning and it makes us smarter, faster, quicker, stronger, more resilient, and especially more confident. And so that's a word that I use all the time with parents. If we want anything out of our children, you know, it may not be all that important to every parent that their kid is super smart. But what's really important to almost every parent that I've ever met is that their child is confident. And when we can build a kid's confidence because they have knowledge and they feel proud of what they know and what they can do and what they can talk about, that to me is the major reason, above all other reasons, Mm -hmm. why reading is so important. Mm -hmm. So... Let's talk then about when parents should be concerned or or what the signifiers are that a child is a reluctant reader. And maybe those are two questions. And I, you know, in terms of age, I just know from experience and and just kind of witnessing 
my own child and peers and when their children learn that, that there is a pretty wide range of when kids start to, to read and also certain educational philosophies, they place an emphasis on literacy or, or learning to read at different times. So what's your opinion on that? And when do we start or what are the kinds of clues that parents would have that their child is either a struggling reader or a reluctant reader? Good question. And it, I, I firmly subscribe to the philosophy that all children bloom at different rates. So if we're talking about the question of when should children be quote unquote reading, that is going to look different for every child. And that's not always a comfortable answer for parents because I understand they really want to know, you know, by five, your kid should be at these milestones and at six, these milestones. And there are milestones out there, uh, and you can find those online, or you can talk to your child's teacher who would easily be able to kind of spit out what milestones they're looking for. But really, if they don't hit those milestones, what's important is not to panic and not to think they never will. What's really critical instead is to do the things that I'll explain many of them today and that I have all over my website. Do the things that create and foster a love of reading in your child because your child will develop and bloom and mature at his or her own rate if they like to read or even hopefully love to read. If they have a desire to read, those milestones will eventually be hit. The, the challenge is and the problem lies with if your child is not happy as a reader, not a confident reader and is a reluctant and or struggling reader, you're going to have a lot harder of a time hitting those milestones and therefore you're going to be working twice as hard. So there's a lot of things I'm going to suggest in this podcast today that parents can do to make sure that their kid loves to read so that those milestones will be hit sooner versus later. And what about then those signifiers that a child is a reluctant reader? Is it is it simply them opting to do other things or kind of grumbling when someone suggests they read a book? <laughs> well, those are two big ones, absolutely. I mean, most parents who have reluctant readers will tell you that, that my child will either A, avoid reading at all costs, uh, often find other excuses. So Parents suggest let's read a book and the child will, you know, want to sharpen pencils, you know, want, <laughs> want to um, re- all of a sudden clean their room, you know, do the things that they really wouldn't do otherwise. That's a big signifier. Mm-hmm. When your child opts to clean his room instead of read a book, um, you know that there's something there's something wrong, you know, and, and an alternative would also be, you know, it's just like grumbling or rolling their eyes, you know, some kind of behaviors that may not be even uh, typical for your child, but start to come out when they're they're sort of annoyed or nervous. Really, a lot of times it's an anxious thing because they're not feeling confident. So you know, where they might um, say to you, "No, you read it." So a lot of times, parents will tell me, "My child doesn't like to read themselves, but they're fine if I read it to them." So the reluctance may be not in reading in general or books in general, but maybe in their own reading. Right? Mm-hmm. They're reading aloud. So the reluctance may come in many different forms and just kind of being aware of where the reluctance lies so you could slowly work on uh, things that will help that particular challenge or reluctance. You mentioned that they might be feeling anxious as one reason why they might might not be gravitating toward reading. Mm -hmm. What are some other, you know, obviously learning differences, and maybe we can touch upon that, a dyslexia and other language-based differences could also be interfering. But in your practice and in the work that you do, what tend to be the most common reasons why a child may be a reluctant reader or not gravitating towards reading? Yeah, well, one big one is that we're asking kids to not read the right materials, quote unquote, right materials. We're not giving them the choice. Instead, we're saying, let's read this book. Or even if we're giving them a choice, the choices may be higher then their reading ability really ought to be taking them. My big advice for parents at home is, and I say very strongly, I'm telling you not to be a reading teacher. I'm specifically stating at home, home reading should look very different than school reading in as much as parents should be fostering the love of reading and working to find the books that their child is comfortable with and building a fluency with and finding recognizable vocabulary words with and finding recognizable and comfortable characters in books and developing and fostering that genuine love and passion for those characters and that story. And so if we're not doing that at home and instead, and I'll tell you, some teachers are suggesting to parents that they should constantly be putting new materials in front of them that should be hard 
harder books to challenge them. I actually totally disagree with that philosophy. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because the kids at home then are getting anxious and stressed out. And there is no place for them, not at home and not at school, to actually relax with the book and enjoy it. Because we're constantly in teaching mode and cramming the hard stuff at them. Um, and that is going to produce a generation of kids with today's standards I'm sort of referring to it, the new standards of the, the federal and state governments. I believe that the rigor is good, but they shouldn't be pushed into the home, that we should not be developing a generation of kids who don't see reading as fun and don't see reading as something we go to for comfort and joy. Instead, they're seeing it as every time I open a book, I've got to be learning and I've got to be trying and struggling. That's not good. So that's where the anxiety may come in. Mm -hmm. uh, and instead, I'm, I'm asking parents, let's reduce or take away that anxiety completely by finding books that are comfortable, that are easy, that children recognize the words. Um, in fact, I'll even go so far as and I have on my website several suggestions of using word list books. Mm -hmm. So if your child is, has a high anxiety around words, don't even start with words. Start with pictures. And let's tell stories about the pictures and look at the beautiful artwork and forget that it's really even a book at all. Um, and then build from there because wordless books will begin to generate a love of reading and a love of books and a love for literacy and all things books uh, without the words being problematic or causing anxiousness. Darren and I are prepping for a big move at the moment. So we are fully leaning into any and everything that simplifies things. And that absolutely includes mealtimes. At a time when my executive functioning skills are being pushed to the limit, even planning and executing dinner for our family these days can feel like a really big lift. That's why I'm especially grateful for Green Chef, a meal service that offers pre-measured and prepped ingredients to my door. Each box is packed with foods you can feel good about, like whole fruits and vegetables, plus lean protein and whole grain options. In fact, one of the things I love most about Green Chef is that they offer options that prioritize gut and brain health, with science-backed recipes that feature ingredients like fiber, antioxidants, and omega-3 fatty acids. During this time of lots of stress, it feels really grounding to know we're supporting ourselves nutritionally. I will take all the support I can get. And Green Chef doesn't just cover dinner recipes. I can add high quality breakfasts, lunches, and snacks to my weekly box from Green Market. Green Chef has a special offer for Tilt listeners. Go to greenchef.com slash tilt50 and use code tilt50 to get 50% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's 50% off plus 20% off your next two months when you use the code tilt50 at greenchef.com slash tilt50. Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating well. Maybe I've watched too many seasons of The Amazing Race, but every time I have to go somewhere on the subway, I treat it like a competition. It's all about making the right gut decisions about which route will get me there the fastest. Sometimes those decisions get me where I'm going early, and other times my gambles don't really pay off. Probiotics can't help with most gut decisions, but if your gut needs a little support, Ritual has your back. Their Symbiotic Plus, a three-in-one supplement, has clinically studied prebiotics, probiotics, and a postbiotic to support a balanced gut microbiome. I've been using Symbiotic Plus for about six months now, and it's become a core part of my morning routine. I take the mini capsule every morning while making my way through my inbox, whether I'm at home or I'm on the road, because it doesn't need to be refrigerated. And the capsule itself is delayed released, which helps it survive the harsh conditions of the upper GI tract for delivery to the colon. And that's exactly where we want it to go. Ritual invested in a study modeling the human colon, which showed that Symbiotic Plus significantly increased microbial diversity and the growth of beneficial bacteria. There's no more shame in your gut game. Symbiotic Plus and Ritual are here to celebrate, not hide your insides. Get 25% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash tilt. Start Ritual or add Symbiotic Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash tilt for 25% off. Right. I love that suggestion of the wordless books. And that's something, you know, when Asher was younger, we looked at a lot. I mean, that taps into everything that you want, right? Activating the imagination and you still can be creative if you're co-reading that with a child too. be creative in the vocabulary you use and all of that. So that's a great, absolutely a great idea. Mm -hmm. And also, as you were talking about that, I was thinking about 
there are so many great books out there that have a lot of illustrations, like I'm thinking of the Big Nate series or the Timmy Failure books or books that are kind of this new genre almost of illustration, cartoon, comics slash, you know, a, a diary, diary of a wimpy kid is another one. Mm-hmm. And so what do you think of books like that? I mean, in I, Asher used to read them over and over. He thinks they're hilarious. And, and I imagine that those are good books for reluctant readers as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because if a reluctant reader is reading anything that's approvable right, by a parent, the parent has to say, I, I agree with this content. It's not you know, philosophically wrong for my family or it's not too above their head as far as maturity wise. But other than that, what a child gravitates to, if, if they're gravitating to books at all over technology, like video games, for example, then I say, you know, the more the merrier. Mm-hmm. Um, stock the home with those books. I mean, I don't mean forever necessarily. I don't mean that a child should never again, you know, read something that's got a little bit more depth to it. But in the meantime, if you're considering your child a reluctant or struggling reader, but there's a hook and you, you know, whether it be graphic novels or the, the really funny books that are out there, I'm, I'm all about them. I think there's so much to be gained by using those books to hook children into, you know, re- the world of reading. Well, you mentioned technology, and I'm just wondering what advice you have or what thoughts you have on that kind of push and pull between technology and and going offline. Sure. Well, I do have very firm advice. Um, you know, it's my philosophy that has been honed over time through a lot of research. I just want to say I'm not coming out with this is just my feelings on this or my own opinion. But I, I have changed my philosophy over time. Originally, before I did a lot of research, my personal opinions was that technology was a great way to engage kids with reading, particularly if you could do ebooks and Kindles and or reading about the video games that they like to play and so on. And I still don't disagree with that now. But through the amount of research I've done on the detriments of too much screen time and the amount of screen time kids get to today's world, I have really come to the conclusion that I believe that parents should be limiting screen time to, uh, in, in elementary students, no more than one hour, and that hour should be worked for. In other words, that's a privilege. It shouldn't be a right in every home. Uh, in particular, also video games and any kind of video games. And that you asked about the struggle and sort of like the back and forth between it. In my opinion, kids need to finish the the things that are good for them first. So, for example, let's take reading completely out of the picture and say, families, if you were going to feed your children, uh, would you offer them dessert first or would you offer them a healthy meal first? Right. Well, of course, kids are going to um, do better in everything and feel healthier if they have a good salad and, you know, meat and potatoes, if you're not a vegetarian or something healthy um, to eat first. And then, you know, you have a little dessert afterwards. You have a small bowl of ice cream. You may have a couple of cookies and that's considered a treat. Right. But, you know, if you let kids to their own devices and you put carrots or cookies on the table, actually adults too, which one would we choose? <laughs> you know, if we weren't really diligent in our choices, we would of course go to the cookies. They taste better. They're, they're more satisfying. They have that immediate t- sensory satisfaction. Well, video games are the exact same and screen time is the exact same. You know, in small doses, it can be okay. And so if we use it as a treat after the healthy stuff, after the reading is done, the homework is done, the, the chores are done, the dinner is done, all those things that are important in life first, then you can have a small dose of video games. One thing that I find that's really important that I tell parents, you don't have to say a word to your child about reading if you work to create a reader-friendly home. So do you mind if I launch into that a little bit? Please do. No, that was my next question. That's great. Right. So um, again, on on my blog, I talk a lot about creating a reader-friendly home and the things that you can do to make that happen. Um, What's really important is not just the, you know, do as I say, but do as I do and do what our family embraces. So um, at home, one way to create a reader-friendly home is that parents and others and sib- older siblings of, of kids need to be readers as well, or at least you know mimic reading, have, have newspapers around the house, have other reading uh, materials out that you enjoy to show your child that you read too. You know, because if a parent's on their cell phone all the time, checking Facebook and texting and answering emails, like our modern lives uh, you know, insist that we do today, and they're not really sitting down with the book either, it's really hard for a child to determine that reading is important, mm-hmm. right? But also, 
where in the house invites a child to read? Is there a, you know, a comfy chair with a stack of books nearby just for that child, sort of curated just for that child? Um, is there a quiet corner uh, with a chair that's big enough for the child, but maybe is nobody else's place to sit? Is there child-friendly um, words and artwork right in that little space? Maybe something that the child created uh, on the weekend or at uh, school that they'll feel proud of, but they want to hang in that corner, or maybe it's in their bedroom. Although I do believe that if you're going to create a reader-friendly nook, it should be someplace relatively central to the middle of the house so that the family gathers there. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, because if you expect your child to go off to their room to read and that's where the corner or the only corner is, then you really can't monitor that when you're downstairs in the kitchen making, making dinner. Um, so it's not that there, sh there should be some reading upstairs too and bookshelves and all that, but really to have a place in, in the center of the home. Um, and it doesn't have to be anything fancy. I'm just talking about a beanbag chair and a, and a, you know, a stack of books. If that's, you know, if you have a very minimal space, like some of our, you know, our urban families are really cramped for space. And um, so I'm, um, so don't have to be decked out, but some place that really says this, is, we read and this is where we do it and it shows mm -hmm. uh, because that helps a child develop the love. If they feel like they've got a place to go and it's their own spot, it's unique to them and they've decorated it and the books that they have picked out are in the basket right there. There's a big difference between that and saying, okay, go find a spot on, you know, where everybody else sits or at the kitchen table, which is really not a comfortable place to be reading. You know, maybe doing homework, fine, but when you want to read a book, you want to sort of get cozy. And if we create a cozy atmosphere for kids, they're, you know, if it's comfortable, that mindset of being comfortable, then, then reading will feel more comfortable. Well, and I think a lot of our kids too are sensory, uh, have sensory issues, and they really respond to that kind of cozy, you know, the idea of a cozy reading nook is really attractive. And I know with Asher, if he has the right, super soft fleece throw, you know, and a little pillow and a favorite stuffy, and I offer to make him tea, forget about it, it's a trifecta, <laughs> he could not be happier than to read. So I think that especially for, for kids who have sensory issues, creating that cozy space can absolutely can or, go a long way. You know, children who have um, who are easily distracted, if they have ADHD, for example, um, you know, that's another perfect reason why that they need their own little spot and they need it to be quiet and they need it to have like their things around them, but not the TV going on in the background and the video games sitting out in front of them. They could, you know, reach for those instead. I, I do want to point out that if you want children to choose reading also over technology, you can't have the video game sitting around so easily accessible because, again, it goes back to you got cookies or carrots on the table. I'm going to go for the cookies. I will, too, personally. So if the cookies, though, are on the top shelf in a plastic bag, you know, I need to go get a ladder to get them out and I've got a bowl of fresh cut you know, fruit in front of me, I'm easily going to take the fruit. It's just easier, you mm -hmm. know, So and it, and it is good. So let's make the books very easy to access and make the technology um, harder, you know, make the video games harder, make the things that are distracting. I, I, it doesn't have to be video games. Your child may be distracted by something else that's not, you know, as let's say you, uh, you don't want them to spend as much time on whatever that thing may be anything else, then, then that should be harder to access and the book should be simple, <laughs> very easy. Yeah. And I love what you said too about modeling. I think that we as parents sometimes forget that our kids are watching absolutely everything that we do and mm -hmm. taking note. More than on. we know, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that is, uh, that's especially with the iPhones and our kind of desire to just whip it out to check things. And that's something I personally am just trying to catch myself on. And if I, go we go to brunch or to get a hot chocolate around the corner let's let's bring our books with us and and leave the phone at home that's what we're trying to do we all sit there <laughs> reading our mm -hmm. respective books and that's right. kind of a nice nice cozy thing to do together too okay, i love it and you know what actually you're reminding me to mention when you say cozy and hot chocolate and making tea and so on is that what we want to do is tie the two together. We want kids to make, you know, it's like the Pavlov's theory of the dog with the bell ringing. You know, if, mm -hmm. if a child gets a hot chocolate every time he gets a book, let's say, or something cozy, something good, something that makes him feel warm every time he, uh, he picks up a book to read, they will associate reading with positive, with comfortable, with, you know, love and warmth. Mm -hmm. Instead of that, if you go back to the beginning of the interview, instead of those things that provoke anxiety, so many times um, kids associate reading with something that provokes anxiety. So we've got to do everything we can to counter 
that and make reading associated with the positive, um, with love, with comfort, with joy. And so that's why it's great, you know, bring and, and have a hot chocolate and there's automatic feelings of coziness mm-hmm. <laughs> going Absolutely. on, right? For everybody, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Mm-hmm. I wanted to ask you about co-reading. Even Asher is 12 now, loves to read. And he still is part of our homeschooling. He wants me to always be reading to him every day. So we always have a book series that we're going through. And in fact, we're going through a book series now where it's been over a year. We're reading this series called The Guardians of Kahul, which by the way, amazing middle grade series for listeners Mm -hmm. out there. I absolutely (laughs) love it. I'll be so sad when it's over. And also when it is part of his bedtime routine with his dad, they are right now they're going through Lord of the Rings together. So that's just Mm -hmm. part of our bonding together. And he loves to be read to. And we he actually still goes to sleep listening to a book on tape that my mother recorded for him. So any thoughts about that idea of co reading? Does that like what is the research show in terms of the role of that? Sure. Love, love, love uh, the whole idea. And, you know, reading aloud to another human being is an amazing way to make a connection. And it's not just, you know, it's not about parents teaching kids to read sometimes. Like your son, for example, who's an avid reader, he probably doesn't want to be um, you to read aloud because he's learning, although he is still learning. He's learning vocabulary and background knowledge and all those things. But in his mind, it's comfortable. It's family time. You know, it's just coziness, it's good stories. Um, instead of watching it on TV, it's a picture in his mind. He's probably an exceptional visualizer. And the instead, the voice is coming from you telling the story. And I think that there should be no age <laughs> that as long as the child is still in a, a classroom somewhere, that reading aloud should be happening. And at home, as long as they'll allow you to read aloud to them, you should. If they're at 15, they're still wanting you to read books, go ahead and do it. There's nothing wrong with that. You're modeling vocabulary. And more importantly, if the parent is a stronger reader, you're modeling fluency, you're modeling what it should sound like, what voice inflection sounds like, when to stop at punctuation, how you change your voice when you see quotation marks into a character's, into the kind of character and the personality of the character. There are so many things going on, so many nuances going on behind the scenes when you're reading aloud that there's just innumerable benefits for all ages. So keep doing it. (laughs) It's fantastic. Hey there, it's Debbie. I love making this show and sharing conversations about how to support our awesome neurodivergent kids. I've seen how even one little insight from an interview can spark a big shift in daily life. But I know that raising complex kids can be messy and lonely. And just when we think we figured it out, something comes up that boots us right back to feeling overwhelmed and stuck. That's why I've poured everything into creating a way for parents like us navigating complex parenting journeys to join together and chart a path that feels positive, hopeful, and doable. It's the brand new Differently Wired Club experience. In the club, you'll get personal support from me and other seasoned parent coaches, six live calls every month where you can connect and get your personal questions answered, the opportunity to learn directly from authors and experts like I have on this show, monthly themes for getting specific and tactical, an exclusive private podcast feed, and the best, most generous community of parents. Seriously, these folks show up for themselves and each other, and that right there is really everything. Because it's a daily reminder that we're not alone. Our kids aren't broken, and we have totally got this. The recently rebooted Differently Wired Club is on a brand new platform with its very own iOS and Android app. It is such a great space. However you learn, whatever your style, no matter the ages, genders, and neurodivergent profile of your children, the Differently Wired Club can help you cultivate the positive shifts you're hoping for. Join us today by going to tiltparenting.com slash club. That's tiltparenting.com slash club. I hope to see you on the inside. If you're a parent, I invite you to join us at the Mindful Mama podcast, where it's all about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. With sometimes hilarious and always thought-provoking experts and friends, at Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you have calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm Hunter Clark Fields, and I can't wait to see you there. Listen in to the Mindful Mama podcast.
Likewise, then, I, I, Asher also, since he was a little guy before he was reading, was always listening to books on tape. Like we had the entire Winnie the Pooh on tape. We had the roll, all the Roald Dahl books on, ta- on tape. Uh, maybe tape's the wrong word. We're not that old. Um, <laughs> see, on CD. Yeah. CD, yeah. But he, so he would listen, you know, just while he's doing Legos, we would pop on, you know, James and the Giant Peach or Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and he would just listen to that over and over again while doing other things. So it's, I'm imagining, is it the same benefit as if someone's reading, a, you know, a family member's reading to you? Sure. I mean, the only difference is that it's a different voice, really, right? So um, and if it's a family member, you're able to make a bond with your child through that experience. If it's not a family member, all the other benefits still exist, right? All the other benefits of modeling and vocabulary and storytelling and visualization, um, which I want to point out is critical, absolutely critical to um, child development and understanding what you're reading. So when you get read aloud to, the only you're not actively reading. So the only thing that you have to practice in that moment is painting pictures in your mind of the story and what's going on. And that skill set is so critical to being a strong reader and also parlaying that into other content areas as you get into higher grades in school, that reading aloud and being read to and being, you know, being the recipient of a read aloud is an, is an absolute boon for developing visualization skills. That's very cool. Well, before we go, I- And I don't know if I prepped you in advance that I'd be asking this question, but I'm wondering if you have any favorite books you wish every family had in their library. (laughs) Sure, I do. I do want to say, too, um, you know, parents feel sometimes anxious themselves about this building a home library. Sometimes they're worried that, you know, it's costly to purchase books. And what if my child doesn't like them or only wants to read them once? And to that, I say, the public library is, a, is an amazing resource. Um, use it wisely mm-hmm. because um, everybody should have a library card because you don't have to own books to be able to create an, a robust yep. family library. Um, but if you want to purchase them, what I suggest is parents purchase classics and keep all the other ones to the, to the public library. And the classics are ones that kids mm-hmm. always love and they're also wonderful to pass down. So, you know, classics like before bedtime stories like Good Night Moon, for example, which every, every child on the planet has read. And, you know, all of Eric Carle's work. I'm a big fan of Eric Carle. The Very Hungry Caterpillar is one of you know the, the most well-known books on the planet that he's written. And Where the Wild Things Are by Maurice Sendak, for example. Like, There's no child that doesn't know about that story. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and as I mentioned earlier, word list books, if your child is really anxious. you know, there, there are, I have on my website access to lists of word list books that I recommend, and you can go there. They're all medal award-winning books that are excellent for for visualization and imagination. But then if we get into chapter books, again, I love, I'm a big fan of the classics. Anything by Roald Dahl, first of all, it's just yeah, amazing. Absolutely. My favorite book by Roald Dahl is I Love Boy. Um, it's sort of a story life, little memoirs of his life. Of course, you know, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and the BFG, all excellent books by Roald Dahl. Um, but then you know, there's newer books out too. I mean, what, what J.K. Rowling did for the reading world, of, you mm. know, for kids in the reading world has transformed just, you know, the way, especially millennials today, the way they see books. So if you can get your kid hooked on a series like Harry Potter, I mean, you mentioned that other series that you love, um, a series can really just hook your child and keep them involved in reading for a long time because they get comfortable with the characters, they get comfortable with the setting, and then they don't have to keep changing their patterns around that. All you need to do is just move with the storyline. So any great series that you can get a recommendation from, I think is a great idea. And um, also I want to throw out, you know, RJ Palacio's work with the Wonder series and um, particularly for the, for the, for the Tilt um, listening group, because it's about a child who has differences. You know, he has physical differences that he he struggles a lot. Uh, he was homeschooled in his younger years and then goes to public school and the, the struggles that he goes through and then eventually, um, you know, the, the uh, friends that he makes and how they support him. It's just a phenomenal story. And now she's expanded it into multiple books. So highly recommend that series to parents. And I think kids who struggle with reading and don't like to read and may also have a hard time making friends might really gravitate to that book. We read that book together many years ago. And it was I didn't, I didn't realize there are more in the series. So that's good to know. And we loved it. And I would just add in and now I'm thinking I should do a whole episode on books, because, you know, I'm always <laughs> looking for a series, I couldn't agree more a series are so fantastic for 
avid readers because once or to develop that because once they hook into a character, it's a lot less work, right? For them, they can kind of continue mm, on and they want to. And a lot of times they see the character in themselves and that's why they love it. And so they can relate to the character. And that actually, when a character is relatable, is one of the hooks for a reader. Sometimes we give boys books to read with the, with the um, you know, the, the main character is a female and, and girls, but the main character is a male. And that's not always a problem, but sometimes it is a problem. And the child doesn't like to say, I don't like to read or I don't like the book. Well, it's really because they can't relate to the main character, the protagonist. They don't, they don't see themselves in that person. Yeah, makes sense. I'm just going to mention a few other books, and then I want to hear about how people can connect with you. Um, Dr. Seuss was a huge favorite for us and so fun to read together and fun just to kind of read over and over again because of the language play. And then also same with with Shel Silverstein for the same reason. Those are two that were favorites in our house when Asher was younger. And he's still, we don't have the Dr. Seuss books here, but we moved all the Shel Silverstein books to the Netherlands with us. They're on our bookshelf and he still periodically picks them up and goes through them. And I, I see him laughing, you know, on the couch reading them. But and the series that we also, the one I mentioned is The Guardians of Gahul. The other one is called The Edge Chronicles. So um, I'll post all of these books on the show notes page. So uh, if you are listening and you are looking for some fresh content for your kids, maybe this will be a good start for ideas. But before we go, you've mentioned your blog and your website. Can you tell us how parents can find you online? Where Where should they go and how can they kind of interact with you? My website address is www.innovativereading.com. And at that address, I have a, um, a drop down for all my blog articles. And you'll find um, all the research that, that I've, and it's not boring, dry research. I kind of make it fun and easy to read <laughs> because it's not fun to read research. But all of the, the research that I've been mentioning about, you know, um, reading for reader friendly home and also video games and all those kinds of things, I write about there. And I think parents also should know that every blog article. I put out comes with a free download that will give you tips, strategies, and techniques and things to say to your child to take what I wrote about and make make it uh, immediately doable in your home. So again, that's at InnovativeReading.com on my blog. And I also um, really would love to have parents connect with me on Facebook at Innovative Reading with Dr. Carol, Dr. Colleen Carroll on Facebook. Um, I'm on Twitter and I'm on Instagram. So there's lots of ways that you can reach out to me. On my website, by the way, there's a free workbook download that gives parents it's three ways to ensure your child loves to read. And if you sign up for my newsletter, you'll get that download for free. And there's just amazing strategies right in there. So that's it. Excellent. And again, I will I'll include links to, to everything that Colleen just mentioned on the show notes page. So you don't have to be jotting down notes furiously right now. Uh, but I want to take a minute to just thank you so much for coming on this show today. This is a different kind of episode for us, but I think it's really important in general that we're talking about these issues that are, affect all kids, but they there might be special considerations for our Differently Wired audience. And for us, reading has been a refuge. It's an emotional regulation strategy for Asher. It's what helps him calm down. And, it's, and I, I hope that this helps inspire other families to kind of build more reading into their world if it isn't already. So thank you again for, for coming on the show and sharing all this great info today. That was my pleasure. I really enjoy it. I'm happy to do it again in the future. If you want to dive deeper into a particular topic, it might be my pleasure. Excellent. You've been listening to the Tilt Parenting Podcast. For the show notes for this episode, including links to Dr. Colleen Carroll's website and blog, and links to all the great book suggestions we threw out during our conversation, go to this episode's show notes page at tiltparenting.com slash session 41. If you like what you heard on today's episode and you haven't already done so, please consider subscribing to our podcast on iTunes or leaving a review. Both of these things help our podcast get more visibility. And lastly, if you're not already signed up for our newsletter, I would love for you to join our Tilt Parenting online community. I send out short weekly updates with links to new content on the Tilt website, articles, and resources just for you. Thanks again for listening. For more information on Tilt Parenting, visit www.tiltparenting.com.
Are you overwhelmed by the things that get in the way of you doing what you want to do? Are you looking for ways to simplify life to better align with your values? Do you want to create space in your schedule so you have room for more of the good stuff? Play, joy, relationships, gratitude, and more? If you answered yes to any of these questions, I invite you to check out Edit Your Life, a podcast to help you edit the unnecessary from your life so you have more room to enjoy the awesome. Through episodes with me, Christine Co., and a range of super smart, compassionate, and thoughtful guests, you'll come away with big picture insights and practical ways to declutter your home, schedule, and mental space without getting bogged down by perfection. I have always believed that small moments and actions matter tremendously. My goal is to help you find agency and space in your life through doable baby steps that will leave you feeling accomplished instead of overwhelmed. Check out Edit Your Life wherever you enjoy your podcasts.